Thanks, Dr. Hansen. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Merchant for our talk this evening. Dr. Merchant is an assistant professor of medicine, Department of uh, Medicine and Division of Cardiology and Electrophysiology at Emory University School of Medicine since 2014. Um, he started his uh, education at the top of academic ladder when he received his Bachelor of Arts in Religion at, at Emory University as an undergraduate, finishing summa cum laude. He then tumbled down the, the academic ladder when he went to Duke, uh, where he earned his MD and was awarded AOA. Um, and then he went further down the academic ladder and made uh, some poor decisions and went to uh, Harvard uh, and did a three-year <laughs> internal medicine residency at Massachusetts General Hospital, and then decided to stay there at MGH and completed a three-year clinical and research cardiology fellowship. He then wised up and came back up the ladder. He joined Emory to uh, begin his professional career as assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Medicine and Division of Cardiology, and then went back for more uh, punishment with training in electrophysiology uh, at Emory from 2012 to 2014, and then since then on back. So Dr. Faisal Merchant is here. He did all of his training just to come here to tell the Grange about atrial fibrillation. <laughs> So, uh, thanks everyone for uh, inviting me to be here, and Mark can thank you, I guess, for uh, the introduction. Um, so, I, as he said, I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. I'm mostly up at Midtown. Um, I actually spend a couple days a month here in LaGrange. I've been seeing patients over the hospital, and actually today is my first clinic here at, the, uh, at this location. And I'll be here one or two Tuesdays a month from here on out seeing mostly cardiac ED patients. Um, and I'm going to talk today about atrial fibrillation, uh, kind of bread and butter, not going to talk too much about ablation, like that stuff, more the sort of primary care, general cardiology approach to uh, AFib. Um, we'll talk a little bit about diagnosis, a little bit of evaluation and management when seeing people with AFib, and then finish up talking about treatment. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to stop me along the way. Um, hopefully this will be fairly useful. Um, and interactive, ideally. Uh, so I don't have any relevant disclosures in terms of anything that we'll be talking about today. So as I said, we'll start off talking a little bit about diagnosis, and specifically we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the less commonly discussed aspects of diagnosis, what to do when people are found to incidentally have AFib, um, which seems to happen more and more. Uh, a little bit about evaluation and treatment, we'll kind of split into three parts. We'll talk a little bit about risk factor modification as a treatment strategy, uh, about anticoagulation for stroke prevention, and then treatment of symptoms. So it's, you know, we all see a lot of AFib. There's obviously AFib gets much more common with age. Um, and over the age of about 50 or 60 or so, somewhere on the order of a third of everybody is going to have AFib at some point. Um, and so the vast majority of us in this room at some point are going to have some AFib. It's incredibly common. We all see it in our practices. Um, if you see somebody who comes in with palpitations or some other cardiac symptom, you get an EKG, um, if there's some kind of symptom triggered evaluation, that's relatively common in terms of making a diagnosis. That's probably the most common way that people present is with some kind of symptom that gets evaluated and they're found to have AFib. The flip side to that is that we see a lot of people these days who have pacemakers, they have defibrillators, they've got implantable root monitors for other reasons, and you happen to see periods of atrial fibrillation on those devices. Um, it's really common people have pacemakers. And you can imagine a lot of elderly people have pacemakers for sinus nerve dysfunction or other kinds of conduction disease. And they've got a lead sitting in their atrium all the time. So if their atrium fibrillates for even a few minutes, you'll see it on the pacemaker interrogation. And the question is, what do you do with that? This is somebody who's had no symptoms really and just incidentally detected it. And here's a little bit of data in that regard. Um, this is a big registry study that was just recently published of people who have pacemakers and defibrillators without any known history of atrial fibrillation. They got their devices for unrelated reasons. And if you follow those people over the course of about three years or so, this doesn't project very well, um, but over 30, nearly 40% of people had some atrial fibrillation detected on their device. So we're going to see this. Now here the atrial fibrillation was anything above just a couple of minutes or so. So these weren't necessarily long episodes. But the question is, when you start to see incidental atrial fibrillation like that, at what point do you start to have to worry about anticoagulation 
for somebody who's having these silent episodes of atrial fibrillation. Now, this is very this question of how much AFib you need to have in order to merit anticoagulation is very much a moving target. Um, and just in the last few years, the threshold seems to have changed. This paper was actually just published. There was a study in the New England Journal uh, published about a year and a half, two years ago, which suggested that the risk of AFib went up, if, or the risk of stroke from AFib went up if you had an individual episode lasting more than about five, five and a half minutes or so. They went back and subclassified those people, and this curve in yellow here, this is the stroke rate, and the risk of stroke really seems to be highest if any individual episode of AFib is over about 24 hours or so. So right now, that's kind of the cut point that I use for these asymptomatic episodes of AFib. If they're lasting more than a few hours, six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, I start to worry. If you start to see episodes of AFib that are only lasting a few minutes, which are very common, I don't necessarily anticoagulate most of those people currently um, because the data doesn't suggest that stroke risk is very high, but this is very much a moving target in terms of how much uh, atrial fibrillation should merit anticoagulation. So in terms of these sort of asymptomatic episodes of atrial fibrillation, the other thing that's very unclear, is, as we talked about, the threshold is unclear. The other thing that's strange is that you would assume that if somebody, for instance, has a stroke and they've got a pacemaker, that if their stroke was due to atrial fibrillation, if you interrogated their pacemaker, you would see episodes of atrial fibrillation in the few weeks before or the few days before they had the stroke. Unfortunately, the temporal correlation stuff, it doesn't correlate very well. The, episode, the incidence of having AFib detected from a device in the 30, 60, 90 days before stroke is not significantly higher than it is during any other two or three month period. And why that discrepancy exists, we don't understand very well. It may be that the presence of AF is sort of a marker of an underlying propensity to stroke that we don't understand very well, but the temporal correlation is not as good as we expect it to be. Um, and that only confounds this whole issue of what to do with silent atrial fibrillation and how to manage it. But like I said, although there is not a, that it, this is sort of in flux, at least for right now, consensus guidelines recommend anticoagulating based on risk factors. We'll talk a little bit about uh, risk stratification. And currently, I and most of us are using a threshold of about 24 hours of AFib in order to make a determination of anticoagulation. But like I said, that number has changed over the last few years and may continue to change. Now, what we're talking about here is really sort of silent subclinical atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> if you see somebody who comes into the emergency room with palpitations and they're found to be an AFib, or you see them in your clinic and they've got clinically documented AFib, not just from a device, um, then that 24-hour number probably doesn't apply. Those people, we just assume that they have spontaneous clinical AFib and anticoagulate them based on risk factors. But for these device-detected episodes of AFib, the number seems to be somewhere between about 6 and 24 hours as a threshold. The other thing that I want to talk about a little bit in terms of diagnosis and device-detected AFib is what to do with people who have cryptogenic stroke. Obviously, a lot of people have cryptogenic strokes um, or TIAs, and you do a basic workup. Often, they'll get a carotid. Maybe they'll get a 24-hour halter or a 30-day event monitor or something like that. And you don't happen to see any atrial fibrillation during that period. Particularly as people get older, atrial fibrillation likely accounts for an increasing percentage of ischemic stroke. And in people who have cryptogenic strokes where you've done a basic workup and haven't identified a cause, there's more and more movement toward using these kinds of implantable loop monitors to try to detect subclinical episodes of AFib if you haven't caught anything on a holter monitor or an event monitor. The yield of like a 24-hour event monitor or even a 30-day event monitor is actually relatively low. These implantable loop monitors, this is what the old generation looked like, and this is a smaller, this is called the Medtronic Link monitor, but there are competitor products also. Um, but it's really quite small. You can put it in, in the office even just got this little injectable tool. And this device can stay in for, the battery life is over a couple of years. You can leave it in for two, three years. And the yield of detecting atrial fibrillation um, over the course of about 36 months or so in people who have cryptogenic strokes um, is fairly high. Now, these studies use a shorter duration definition for atrial fibrillation. So regardless of what cut point you use for people who have cryptogenic strokes, 
um, without a clear cause, I encourage you to think about referring them for implantable monitors to look for atrial fibrillation. Um, because if you look hard enough in most of these people, you end up finding atrial fibrillation. If they've had a quick agenic stroke, obviously this has important implications in terms of uh, anticoagulation to prevent them from having another event. Sorry. Um, Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of diagnosis of atrial fibrillation is there's been a lot of discussion recently about whether you should actually look for atrial fibrillation in somebody who's asymptomatic. Let's say they don't have a pacemaker, they don't have some other device that would allow you to detect atrial fibrillation, should you look for it? I mean, obviously atrial fibrillation is a big cause of stroke, um, and strokes are associated with significant morbidity, particularly when they're due to atrial fibrillation, as we'll talk about. Um, and given the prevalence of atrial fibrillation, does it make sense to screen? This is very much a moving target. There was recently, actually just a study recently reported called Reveal AF, where they took about 385 patients who did not have any known atrial fibrillation. Now these were all relatively older patients, mean ages around 72 or so, and they had additional risk factors for atrial fibrillation and stroke. They were hypertensive, they were diabetic, but not having had any known atrial fibrillation, and they implanted those same loop monitors in all of these people and followed them over the course of a couple of years. And you can see if you follow these people out to about two years or so, somewhere on the order of about 30 to 40 percent of people will have atrial fibrillation detected by one of these devices. Now, whether now this is not an anticoagulation study, so no one has yet proven that if you look for atrial fibrillation and you find it, and then you anticoagulate people based on that, that you're going to reduce their risk of stroke. That's kind of the next question is if we found atrial fibrillation using a method like this, would it make sense to anticoagulate people? We don't have any data in that regard yet. Um, but there is some discussion in the in the field right now about whether we should be more actively screening for atrial fibrillation given how prevalent it is. I think we'll hear more about this uh, in time to come. At least for right now in my practice, I don't screen people for atrial fibrillation unless there's some reason to look for it, i.e or something like that. For the average patient, even if they're older and they have risk factors, if they don't have any symptoms of concern, I don't routinely do this kind of screening, but it, this is something that's gaining a little bit of momentum in the field, um, and I suspect you'll hear more about uh, in time to come. So those are kind of the topics that I wanted to just briefly discuss in terms of diagnosis, um, because some of these issues with device-detected AFib, uh, we don't talk about quite as much. Um, I was going to move on to talk a little bit about evaluation if you see somebody who has atrial fibrillation, either in the hospital, in the clinic, what kind of tests to order, what's really necessary, what's not. By and large, part of the most important thing we do for anybody who's got newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation is stroke risk classification. We'll talk a little bit about that. Beyond that, occult thyroid disease, particularly hypothyroidism, is pretty common. I think it probably makes sense to get a thyroid panel or check a thyroid, make sure that there's not occult hypothyroidism. In most people who have newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation, they usually get an echocardiogram. Um, mostly we check their EF because, again, that helps in terms of risk stratification for stroke. And we'll talk about CHADS and CHADS 2000 scores. But it's helpful to know the ejection fraction. Occasionally, you see somebody who has atrial fibrillation at the initial presentation of significant mitral valve disease, either mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis, something like that. Um, and the left atrial side can be helpful. People have referred to the left atrial side as kind of the hemoglobin A1C for your heart in terms of risk stratification. The larger your left atrium is, the higher your likelihood of recurrent atrial fibrillation in the long run. So if you see somebody with AFib, they've got a relatively large left atrium. Often that'll make you think it's going to be a little harder to keep this person in sinus rhythm. Maybe they'll need antiarrhythmics, things like that, in order to maintain sinus rhythm if you're going to try to. But it also gives you some idea of what their risk of recurrent atrial fibrillation is. So I think those are relatively useful things to do as a basic evaluation. We see lots of people who get referred to us who have presented with atrial fibrillation and have gotten stress tests. Some of them have ended up diagnostic casts, things like that. Atrial fibrillation is very rarely the manifestation of underlying ischemic heart disease. So unless there is some other symptom, angina, dyspnea, exertion, something, that makes you worry about occult coronary disease. I don't routinely get stress tests or any other kind of coronary risk stratification unless there's something else driving that. But atrial fibrillation in and of itself 
for the most part, doesn't necessitate uh, the schemic evaluation. So I think doing the echo, risk stratification, and getting power now is probably a useful place to start. I'm going to segue from there now for the, second, uh, for the better part of the talk now, talking about treatment of atrial fibrillation. Um, and like I said, we'll, yeah. We have some questions along the way. Yeah. What about the sleep apnea? Yeah, actually, we're going to get to the sleep apnea. Yeah, that's a, okay. per that's a perfect segue. Um, we'll come back to sleep apnea, I think, in the next slide. But um, we're going to talk about treatment in sort of three buckets. Risk factor modification as actually a treatment strategy, not only preventative, but also a treatment strategy. We'll talk about stroke prevention. And then lastly, just in the last few minutes, talk about treating symptoms from atrial fibrillation disease. In some way, this is symptom treatment is probably the easiest thing to do. Um, but in terms of risk factor modification, not only sleep apnea, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, these are all things that we know drive atrial fibrillation. And risk factor modification is helpful not only in preventing atrial fibrillation from developing in the first place, but there's more and more data that modifying risk factors may help reduce your atrial fibrillation burden even once you have it. Um, and the truth is, when people ask, why do I have atrial fibrillation? Most of the time, I just kind of throw my hands in the air and say, well, we don't really understand. And the truth is, there's a lot about fibrillating atria and why certain people with atria fibrillate and certain don't, that we don't understand. We know that the incidence of atrial fibrillation is higher in association with a number of other disease processes, hypertension, heart failure, diabetes, but you could take the exact same two people with hypertension and diabetes and the same ejection fraction, and one of them will have incredibly difficult to control persistent atrial fibrillation, and the other one will never have any atria. What really accounts for that, we don't know. We know that there are genetic determinants, family history is important. But I think that taking a risk factor modification approach when you see somebody who's got AFib is an important thing to do. And in terms of the risk factors that I think are most easily treatable or reversible, I think sleep apnea is probably one of the biggest ones that has started to get more attention now, um, but is often underappreciated. Occult sleep apnea is strongly associated with atrial fibrillation. This is some data on outcomes after ablation of atrial fibrillation. Now, I would say that the vast, vast, vast majority of people with AFib don't need an ablation and can never get an ablation. But it is true that even among the people who get ablations who tend to have a more stubborn symptomatic phenotype, those who have untreated sleep apnea have the worst outcomes after ablation. Those who have treated sleep apnea, their outcomes are actually not that much different than people who don't have sleep apnea. So at least in this population, there's a pretty strong association. Interestingly, if you look across the board of people who have sleep apnea, there have been a number of randomized trials recently published, there's another one published this week, looking at non-invasive ventilatory therapy versus not. And that's a little bit more of a mixed bag in terms of whether treatment of sleep apnea prevents AFib from developing in the first place. Part of the problem with those studies is that the event rates are relatively low. You've got to follow a lot of people with sleep apnea for a long time. And even then, detecting the AFib, unless you're screening in some way, can be a hard thing to do. But suffice it to say that if people have atrial fibrillation and you're concerned about sleep apnea based on habitus, based on slip symptoms, based on sleep scales, or whatever it is you happen to use in your office, I think this is an important thing to look for. And if they have it, to treat. We've become increasingly aggressive in our practice about looking for sleep apnea, particularly for the kinds of atrial fibrillation patients that we end up seeing, who, as I said, often have a more symptomatic and stubborn kind of phenotype. Untreated sleep apnea is a big cause of recurrent needs. Obesity is another thing. Again, just a lot of the two are all overlap. A lot of people who are overweight also are going to have sleep apnea, they're going to have poorly controlled hypertension. Um, but obesity in and of itself is also a big driver of recurrent atrial fibrillation. Um, and this is some data actually looking for, there's a big group in Australia that's done a lot of work looking at weight loss specifically as a treatment strategy for atrial fibrillation. But if you take people with AFib, those who lose weight actually have uh, better AF3 survival than whose weight is either stable or fluctuates or those who gain weight. Um, and the more weight you lose, the better your AFib outcomes are. Um, and there's actually a lot of data recently on people who have undergone gastric bypass surgery their AFib burden, those who have AFib before surgery, go way down after gastric bypass surgery. What a lot of those mechanisms are, how much of it's due to obesity, how much of it's inflammatory components from adipose tissue, I mean, it's probably a number of things, resolution of sleep apnea, 
all of which are hard to tease out. But suffice it to say, um, oh, being overweight or obese is a important, I think, thing to try to treat uh, in terms of uh, reversible drivers for atrial fibrillation. Alcohol consumption is another big one. You see a lot of people who enjoy having a cocktail or two, or sometimes more at night, who have atrial fibrillation. AFib is a big driver, uh, or alcohol consumption is a big driver of atrial fibrillation. I think if you remember back to medical school, we've all kind of heard of the holiday heart syndrome, where people will go out on New Year's or some holiday binge drink and show up in the ER the next day with AFib. And that certainly, we see that phenotype pretty frequently. But even outside of isolated binge drinking, if you look across a number of our sort of epidemiologic studies, even down to an additional drink a day, and this is a single out, single like seven or eight ounce serving of alcohol, there is an increased risk, statistically speaking, um, of atrial fibrillation, even with very moderate levels of alcohol consumption. Now, sometimes it's hard to tell people, look, I like to have a glass of wine with dinner, you tell me I can't do that anymore because I have AFib. And obviously, I mean, you know, these are discussions to have with individual people. But suffice it to say, at least if you look in terms of epidemiologic associations across the board, even very moderate levels of alcohol consumption are associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. So those are the kinds of at least reversible risk factors that we think about. And I didn't get too much into management of diabetes, and high blood pressure, treatment of congestive heart failure, and a lot of those associated cardiac conditions. But optimal treatment of all those risk factors makes AFib easier to treat. Um, and all of those things are important. <coughs> For a lot of people, if you do enough to modify their risk factors, you don't frequently have to do that much in terms of treating the atrial fibrillation specifically, because their burden often goes down quite a bit, particularly when you see people with a lot of these untreated risk factors. But segueing from treatment of risk factors, I'm going to spend the bulk of the talk talking about stroke prevention, because I think when we see people with atrial fibrillation, this is probably far and away the most important thing that we do. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about risk stratification. We're going to talk about the choice of agents, anticoagulant and anticoagulants, um, and then one slide on non-pharmacologic alternatives. The first thing I think is important to remember is, and I think obviously everybody in this room I think knows this, but atrial fibrillation is obviously a big cause of stroke. But not only is it a big cause of stroke, strokes that are due to atrial fibrillation tend to be more severe and lead to more debility. They're associated with higher mortality rates than strokes that are due to carotid disease or other cerebrovascular disease or other mechanisms. So strokes due to AFib tend to be bad. Um, and that's why there's a real impetus uh, to try to um, anticoagulate as aggressively as possible in people who are at risk of stroke. Um, here you can see, if you look at a number of neurologic indices, this is the Bartell index, people are more debilitated with strokes due to atrial fibrillation than they are strokes that are not due to AFib. Um, and mortality rates, even after one year after stroke, are higher if your stroke is due to AFib than if it was due to a non-AFib mechanism. Not only that, but how much AFib you have, and again, here we're talking about clinically evident AFib, not talking about some of those sort of silent device detected AFibs that we talked about at the beginning. But if you see somebody in the clinic or in the office or in the hospital with AFib, how much AFib you have, whether it's paroxysmal or persistent, doesn't really seem to affect your stroke risk. Your stroke risk is the same. So if you see somebody with paroxysmal AFib and they have two bouts of AFib a year that last a couple of days and then go away, their stroke risk, at least as far as we can tell based on epidemiologic studies, is not significantly different than somebody who's in persistent AFib the entire year. Um, and here, this is one study showing this, but regardless of whether you're at low chats to moderate CHATS2 or high CHATS2, the difference in stroke rate between those who are paroxysmal and those who are persistent is not any different. And a lot of times we'll see people refer to us who are not in anticoagulation. Um, and the reason that they're not, they'll, they'll say, well, my doctor told me I don't have that much AFib. I only have a couple times a year. I don't need to be anticoagulated. But at least in my mind, how much AFib you have doesn't really factor in to the decision to anticoagulate. The other thing that's important to remember is that whether you choose to try to maintain sinus rhythm or let somebody do an AFib, so whether you take a rate control strategy or a rhythm control strategy, also doesn't seem to impact the stroke risk. So if you cardiovert somebody, the decision to cardiovert them, at least in my mind, is not then a decision to try to take them off anticoagulation once they've finished 30 days of anticoagulation. 
cardioversion. In my mind, cardioversion people treat their symptoms, not in order to get them on anticoagulation. And the same is true for ablation. At least currently, we don't have any data that atrial ablation reduces stroke risk. So if I see somebody in the office and we talk about an ablation, the ablation is the treatment of their symptoms. It's because they have palpitations or fatigue or dyspnea or whatever it may be. It's not to get them off anticoagulation. And the vast majority of people that we ablate remain on anticoagulation. Now there's a lot of individual operator variability there, but the strategy that you take for treating atrial fibrillation symptoms shouldn't really affect the decision to anticoagulate. This, I think, will come as no surprise to you, but if you look across a number of studies that have been done over the last couple of decades, if you take people who have atrial fibrillation and look at their CHAZ-2 or their chaz 2 VAT score, pretty consistently, only about 50% of people who should be anticoagulated are actually on anticoagulation. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Obviously, people hate taking anticoagulants. If you try to start somebody on warfarin or start them on a novel agent, that's a 30-minute clinic. Everybody's seen commercials on TV from law firms about novel anticoagulants. I mean, it's a hard thing to do. Um, but I think that a lot of that drives some of this uh, under-treatment. But um, suffice it to say that a lot of people who should be on anticoagulation aren't. Now, the decision to anticoagulate somebody once they've got atrial fibrillation is really based on what their stroke risk is. Um, and there are a number of these stroke risk calculators available. CHADS-2 uh, was used for many years. CHADS-2-VAS seems to discriminate people a little bit better. CHADS-2-VAS is the risk calculator that I use most of the time clinically to make decisions about anticoagulation. If you look at your stroke risk, if you have a CHADS-2-VAS score of zero, your annual stroke risk, here it says zero, it's probably not zero just based on one study, but it's quite low, it's less than 1% per year. If you have a chads 2 vast score of 7, 8, 9, meaning you're older, you've got female gender, hypertension, diabetes, any number of other risk factors, the stroke risk starts to increase. It gets up to around 10% per year, roughly speaking. The threshold, traditionally speaking, for anticoagulation has been somewhere on the order of a chads 2 score, chads 2 vast score of 2 or greater. The reason for that is that the risk of major bleeding from taking an anticoagulant, whether it's warfarin or probably even a novel anticoagulant, major bleeding event rates are probably on the order of about 1% per year in people who take anticoagulation. So it makes sense that your stroke risk rate ought to probably be higher than your major bleeding rate in order for that risk-benefit ratio to tilt in favor of anticoagulation. So for anybody with a chads 2 vast score of 2 or greater, all things being equal, I think they ought to be anticoagulated. And there's a lot of data suggesting that people with a chads 2 vast score of 2 or greater benefit from anticoagulation. Now, practically speaking, what that means is if you look at the individual components of the chads 2 uh, risk score, age 65 to 74 gets you one point. If you're over the age of 75, you get two points. That means that really anybody that you see with atrial fibrillation over the age of 75 ought to be anticoagulated. If you think about it, that's almost everybody that you see with, with atrial fibrillation, right? So right off the bat, if you're over the age of 75 and have atrial fibrillation, you don't even need to remember most of these other risk factors. They should be anticoagulated. If you're a woman over the age of 65, Female gender, for reasons that we don't understand very well, but female gender has across a number of studies been associated with an increased risk of stroke. If you're a female over the age of 65, you've got two points. And that's even if you don't have hypertension, diabetes, any of those things. So really the vast, vast majority of people that we see with atrial fibrillation should be anticoagulated. If you're a man less than the age of 65, and you don't have hypertension, diabetes, prior myocardial infarction, any of those things, if you truly have a chads 2 vast score of zero, those are probably the people that are okay without anticoagulation. But the take-home message from this slide is that the vast majority of people that we see in clinical practice merit anticoagulation. The question that always comes up, well, if you're 80 years old and you're a little bit frail, you got diabetes and hypertension and you have some GI bleeding. 
you're leading risk is obviously going to be pretty high also. Not surprisingly, if you plot stroke risk using Hasbled, CAS2 Asset Score, and you take some score, Hasbled is one of them, it's designed to predict the risk of bleeding. For almost everybody, they are directly proportional there. As your risk of stroke goes up, because you're older and you have more comorbidity, your risk of bleeding events goes up because you're older and you have more comorbidity. Um, and so for most people, that's true. But if you look across the board, regardless of which quadrant you're in, high CHAD2 VASP score, low CHAD2 VASP score, low has blood score, high has blood score, if you're low stroke risk, low bleeding risk, anticoagulation seems to be beneficial. If you're high stroke risk, high bleeding risk, anticoagulation seems to be beneficial. Even if you're low stroke risk, high bleeding risk, this is where it would seem like anticoagulation is least likely to be beneficial. It's still in large epidemiologic population-based studies is beneficial. So for the vast majority of people, regardless of what their bleeding risk is, unless they have clinically evident bleeding episodes, anticoagulation is beneficial. Just based on age and comorbidity, for most people, their bleeding <coughs> risk isn't high enough to outweigh their stroke risk. And that's true almost across the board regardless of where you fall on the spectrum. Now, the form of bleeding that everybody fears most commonly is obviously intracranial bleeding. That seems to far and away be the most highest risk form of bleeding, um, and it's the one that people fear the most. And at least going back from the warfarin era, and we'll talk a little bit about novel anticoagulants, but it is true that for most people, there is a slightly higher risk of intra intracranial bleeding on warfarin than off warfarin. But even off warfarin, over the age of 80, there is a little bit of an increase in intracranial bleeding. And if you really look at the numbers, for most people, their risk of intracranial bleeding is more a function of age. Your risk of spontaneous intracranial bleeding goes up with age. It's more a function of age than it is a function of anticoagulation. Now, if you've had a clinically evident intracranial bleeding episode, that may be different. But at least if you look at the average risk person, their risk of intracranial bleeding is not impacted all that strongly by anticoagulation. It's more a function of age. So this is the other thing that people often state. You see recurring notes all the time that say so-and-so has atrial fibrillation, although they're elderly and have risk factors. We've opted not to put them on anticoagulation. We're going to give them aspirin because they're frail and have higher risk of fall. That is absolutely true for many people, right? Many people have a relatively high risk of falls. They're uh, frail, they use a walker or a cane or something like that. At the end of the day, the risk of bleeding from a fall really is dependent on you sustaining some trauma, significant trauma from that fall, and having a major traumatic bleeding episode. And again, intracranial bleeding is the one that people fall, fear the most, right? You fall backwards, you hit your head, you have an intracranial bleeding episode, you're taking warfarin, and that bleed's likely to be worse than it is if you weren't taking warfarin. But the truth is that if you look at studies of people who have who are at risk of frequent falls, and you look at the actual incidence of major bleeding, including intracranial bleeding, in people who are at risk of falls, and you actually do the do the math, just statistically speaking, any individual elderly patient with an annual stroke risk of five, let's say a CAS2 VAS score of three or four, they would have to fall about 300 times a year. So basically every day in order for their risk of major bleeding as a function of falls to outweigh their risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation without anticoagulation. So for most people, their risk of traumatic bleeding from a fall, again, is not sufficiently high to offset the benefit of anticoagulation. So segueing from there, a little bit talking about specific agents, when you see somebody, what agents put them on? And there's obviously a whole host of agents that you can use. With antiplatelet therapy, you can use aspirin, you can use flavids, you can use anticoagulants, warfarin, and then the novel agents, the bigotran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, any of those banned medications. If you just look kind of across the board, if you take a, a if you plot your stroke risk, say, on a scale from zero to 10, if you put somebody on aspirin, aspirin alone, you get about a 20% reduction in their risk of stroke. If you add Plavix to aspirin, so if you put somebody on dual antiplatelet therapy, you get about another 20% reduction in stroke. 
it's not until you put somebody on Warfarin or one of the novel agents that you really start to get 60, 70, 80% relative risk reduction in terms of stroke. So there's no question that anticoagulation, either with warfarin or a novel agent, is far more efficacious in terms of stroke prevention than antiplatelet therapy. The argument that most people make for using antiplatelet therapy is that I'm worried about bleeding in some variety. But interestingly enough, actually we'll come back to this in a second. If you look at the risk of bleeding on antiplatelet therapy, it's not actually that much lower than the risk of bleeding from anticoagulation. So this is one randomized trial, active uh, A, that randomized people to warfarin versus aspirin and plavix to see whether aspirin and plavix would be better than warfarin for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. It turned out that the aspirin and plavix was not as effective. It was significantly worse at preventing stroke from warfarin. But if you look at the incidence of bleeding here in yellow, the incidence of bleeding was actually higher with aspirin and plavix than it was with warfarin. So for most people, the decision to put them on aspirin and plavix as an alternative to anticoagulation is not only less effective, but the bleeding risk is at least as high, if not higher. So at least in my mind, there's really relatively little role for dual antiplatelet therapy and stroke risk prevention. Even if you look at aspirin by itself, Averroes was a trial that compared aspirin alone versus a pixabet, so a novel anticoagulant versus aspirin in people who were felt to not be good candidates for warfarin. Again, pixaban was far more effective at preventing stroke, and the risk of bleeding between aspirin and pixaban was no different. Your risk of bleeding on Eloquin is about the same as your risk of bleeding on aspirin. So the long and the short of it is, and this is my interpretation of the data, although I think this is true for many people in cardiology and electrophysiology, I don't really think that antiplatelet therapy has any role in stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. And I almost never use it. For the vast majority of people who merit anticoagulation, it's worth the effort to try to put them on an anticoagulant. Because if you put them on an antiplatelet agent, they get very little in terms of benefit with stroke risk reduction, and you're exposing them to almost as much risk in terms of bleeding. So, Aspirin, in my mind, is not a good alternative. In fact, I don't use aspirin for anybody. Even CHADS2 VAP scores are zero. If I see a young, healthy person in clinic with low AFib, 40-year-old guy who's just got AFib, otherwise healthy, CHADS2 VAP scores zero. I don't put them on an anticoagulant, but I don't tell them to take aspirin either, because in my mind, the aspirin only subjects them to a slightly higher risk of bleeding without any clear uh, role in terms of efficacy. So, really limited role for our antiplatelet therapy. Going back to the novel anticoagulants, because obviously we see uh, more and more of these in use, I wanted to point out a couple of things in terms of the novel anticoagulants that I think are sometimes a little bit underappreciated. There have obviously been a number of randomized trials of rivaroxaban, dabigatran, apixaban, adoxaban, compared to warfarin. Across the board, these are meta-analyses of a number of these studies, your risk of stroke is probably a little bit lower with the novel agents than it is with warfarin. Part of that probably has to do with how hard it is to maintain its time and therapeutic range for warfarin, whereas these agents are a lot more consistent. So they are a little bit better in terms of stroke risk reduction. The risk of ischemic stroke is actually not that much lower. The risk of ischemic stroke between a novel agent and warfarin is pretty comparable. Where the novel agents really have the advantage over warfarin is the risk of intracranial bleeding or hemorrhagic stroke is much lower with the novel agents than it is with warfarin. So for people who are at risk of intracranial bleeding or who have had a prior intracranial bleed but you're thinking of putting them back on an anticoagulant, a novel agent has some real benefit. The thing that I think people don't realize is GI bleeding is obviously something that we deal with a lot. And in a number of studies, the risk of GI bleeding with the novel agents, particularly Rely, which was the Bigatran or Pradaxa, Rocket AF was Rivaroxaban or Zarelto, the risk of GI bleeding is actually higher with the novel anticoagulants than it is with warfarin. So for people where you're concerned about bleeding due to GI causes, the novel agents don't actually provide you that much benefit. Apixaban or Eliquis may be the exception, there was no difference in warfarin. 
But at least in terms of GI bleeding, the novel anticoagulants don't seem to have much advantage over warfarin. For intracranial bleeding, they clearly have an advantage. And if you look across the board, the two are pretty comparable. So if I see patients who have been on warfarin for some time and have done okay, they come in and get their INR checked with some regularity, I don't switch them to a novel agent. I leave them on warfarin. Most people who are well managed on warfarin do just fine with it. For people who are newly starting anticoagulation, I don't these, these days I'm not really starting very many new people on warfarin. Most people who are new to anticoagulation, I start them on one of the novel agents because I think it tends to be easier on them, particularly cost is a prohibitor and their renal function will allow it. But those are really the two kind of limitations. Renal function for many people, and you can dose adjust the novel agent and cost still is. So we talked about the antiplatelet agents. So we already briefly um, talked about this a little bit, but like I said, CHAPS 2 VAP score of 2, general consensus and guidelines agree anticoagulation is prudent for all comers. What about a CHAPS 2 VAP score of 1? Um, meaning a guy healthy age of 65 or a woman really of any age. Um, if you have a CHATS2 VAP score of 1, your annual stroke risk from AFib is about 1, 1.5% or so. That's roughly the rate of major bleeding on an anticoagulant. So that's where there's some equipoise. Personally, if I see somebody with AFib with a CHATS2 VAP score of 1, if I don't think their risk of bleeding is inordinately high, they're otherwise re relatively healthy, which many of these people are, I tend to put them on an anticoagulant. If I get to the age of 60, 65 or so, and I've got AFib, I'll take a note. Um, because again, stroke tends to be really debilitating. The true CHADS2 VAS scores of zero, their stroke risk is somewhere on the order of about a half a percent per year. And again, that seems to probably be too low to benefit from anticoagulation because the risk of bleeding starts to outweigh. So what about the people who really can't tolerate anticoagulation? You see some people who you've tried them on an anticoagulant, they've had recurrent GI bleeding, they've had a prior history of intracranial bleeding, they've got some clinically documented bleeding episode, but they're at high stroke risk. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but we do have some of these non-pharmacologic approaches to stroke risk reduction. This is the Watchman device, it's this little nightmare looking umbrella, there's a couple of competitors on the market. But this can actually be put in percutaneously, it's a single point of point access. Um, you put it across the septum into the left atrial appendage. We know that for most people who have AFib, about 90% of their thrombi develop in the left atrial appendage. Not 100%, but about 90%. And if you occlude the left atrial appendage, your risk of having a stroke in the long run is non-inferior to warfarin. So generally what I tell people, and when people are referred for these kinds of things, if people have not been tried on anticoagulation, or they just don't want to take it, or they're reluctant to take it, or they've not had a true clinically documented episode atrial fibrillation, I don't recommend doing these procedures. Right now, these procedures, in my mind, are limited to people who have had clinically documented uh, episodes of bleeding that seem to preclude long-term anticoagulation. They are an alternative to people who cannot take anticoagulation, but they are not an alternative to anticoagulation for average risk people. And at least if you look across most of the studies, for people who got the Watchman device, the risk of ischemic stroke was actually a little bit higher with the Watchman than it was in the people who remained on Wolfram. Perhaps because that other 10% of thrombi that don't occur in the appendage are not treated by this strategy, whereas they may be treated by Wolfram. But the risk of bleeding or hemorrhagic stroke, not surprisingly, is lower if you have one of these procedures done. So these are really for people who have had clinically documented um, bleeding episodes. And the vast majority of people that refer to us for these kinds of procedures, at least in our practice at Emory, probably don't end up getting the procedure. Many of them remain on anticoagulation as long as they tolerate it reasonably well. So now in just the last couple minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about management of symptoms um, for atrial fibrillation. So everything we've talked about so far has been risk stratification, stroke prevention. What do you do about people who actually have symptoms? Now, symptoms of atrial fibrillation can be difficult to sort out. When you see somebody 80 years old in clinic who is found to incidentally be an AFib based on some screening EKG in the pre-op clinic or something like that, 
try to tease out whether they have symptoms from AFib or they just have symptoms from being 80 and hypertensive and diabetic or just being 80 maybe. Um, can be a very hard thing to sort out. Relatively young people, the younger, healthier, more active people are, their symptoms from AFib tend to be a little more obvious. They get palpitations, they get dyspnea and exertion. Often relatively active people won't have a lot in the way of symptoms at rest, but they'll say, I try to go up and down a flight of stairs, I just can't do it anymore. They've got something obvious that seems to correlate with the atrial fibrillation. But in terms of what strategy you take, whether you try to keep somebody in sinus rhythm, keep them out of AFib, rhythm control, or you just control their weight and leave them in atrial fibrillation, really depends on patients. For people who have symptomatic atrial fibrillation, particularly if they have symptoms after rate control, I think rhythm control makes sense. And there you can either cardiovert them, you can put them on an antiarrhythmic drug, or you can think about ablation. For many people, particularly as they get older, rate control seems to be a very reasonable strategy. Um, and really lenient rate control seems to be at least as good as aggressive rate, rate control. For a long time, there was this thought that you had to get people's resting heart rates less than like 80 and get them up and walk them around the office and make sure their heart rate didn't jump up to 120 or something. But a couple of years ago, there was a, a study called RAKE2, which basically randomized people to lenient rate control, meaning a resting heart rate of less than 110. So they're sitting in your office, packing away at 105, 110, or strict rate control with a resting heart rate of 80. And there did not seem to be any big difference in heart outcome. And in fact, there were more adverse events, hospitalizations for syncope, symptomatic bradycardia, and need for pacemakers in the aggressive rate control group. You can imagine if you take somebody 80 years old with AFib and put them on a beta blocker and digoxin or something else, try to get their resting heart rate down to less than 80, there's a lot of times their heart rate's going to be 40, 45, 50, and that's likely to cause more trouble than good. So for most people, lenient rate control seems to be a perfectly reasonable particularly if you can control their symptoms with, rate, with lenient rate control. Sometimes if they continue to have symptoms, you can try stricter rate control, but I tend not to hem and haw too much about their rate control, as long as their rate's not going 130, 140, 160 when they're just sitting around not doing anything. For people who really have very difficult to control rate, particularly a lot of elderly people who don't tolerate medications well, they don't have a lot of blood pressure room, it's hard to get their rates down, they're not great candidates for ablation or cardioversion, that kind of thing. Putting in a pacemaker and doing an AV node ablation is often a great option for those people. You can get them off all of their rate control medications. You don't have to worry about their rates anymore. And then the only thing they have to do is they have to stay on anticoagulation. But again, remember, regardless of which arm you end up on, anticoagulation doesn't change. But for relatively older people where you're having a hard time controlling their rates, a pacemaker and navy junction ablation can be a very useful long-term strategy, particularly if you're trying to get people off medication. Oh, we're about to get booted off. Um, the, uh, this slide here just makes the point that rate control versus rhythm control, these have been studied in a number of randomized trials. At least across the board, there does not seem to be any significant benefit to rhythm control versus rate control. For the vast majority of people whose symptoms can be controlled with rate, with rate control, that seems to be a simpler and at least as effective strategy. We talked a little bit about this already, lenient versus uh, strict rate control. This is the data from race two. No real significant difference in adverse outcomes. And if you looked at the, uh, I mean, in, uh, no real difference in terms of cardiovascular outcomes, and there were more adverse outcomes in the strict control group as opposed to the lenient. Quality of life and a number of other metrics were also similar between the two groups. So when should you think about trying to keep, keep somebody in sinus rhythm? You see somebody with AFib, they're having bouts of AFib that come and go a few times a month, or they're persistently in atrial fibrillation. When should you think about trying to either cardiovert them or refer them for an ablation or something like that? This is more opinion than it is data driven. But we see a lot of people who have transient AFib due to some other predisposing cause. They come into the hospital for gallbladder surgery, they never had AFib before, post-op they go into AFib. Post-op AFib is incredibly common. For many of those people, interestingly enough, if you follow them long enough, even if you get them back in sinus rhythm after surgery, 
over the course of the next several years, their risk of atrial fibrillation is probably higher than people who don't have postoperative atrial fibrillation. And whether that perioperative state is just unmasking some underlying predisposition to AFib is unclear. But for people who have never had AFib and they come into the hospital with sepsis or post-op or something, and there seems to be some transient stressor that might have caused the AFib, I think trying to get them back in sinus rhythm once that transient stressor has resolved makes sense to give them an attempt to move sinus rhythm. A therapeutic trial can often be very helpful. If you're unsure about whether somebody has symptoms due to AFib, they come in, they're found to incidentally be an AFib, they're a little more tired than usual, more sluggish, just not quite up to snuff. A lot of times, I find it helpful to cardio both those people, see them back in the office a couple weeks later. If they're still in sinus rhythm when you cardio them, once they come back to the clinic, just ask them, do you notice any difference before or after the cardio work? Some people will say, you know what, yeah, I really do notice I feel a little bit better. Others will say, I didn't notice a lick of difference. And if they don't notice a lick of difference, weight control, anticoagulation, and lenses. If they do notice a difference, those are the people where I think antiarrhythmic drugs, ablation, those kinds of things can be useful. For people who have symptoms despite weight control, those, the vast majority of people that we end up cardioverting, putting on antiarrhythmic, ablating, are people who have persistent symptoms despite weight control. And then the last one is a relatively softer indication, but if you're 50, 55, 60, you're relatively young and healthy, you have atrial fibrillation, even if you don't have a whole lot in the way of symptoms, we tend to think, for reasons that are very unclear, that trying to maintain sinus rhythm a little more aggressively in those people may be beneficial. And so sometimes we're a little bit more aggressive about trying to maintain sinus rhythm in people who are otherwise relatively young and healthy and don't have a lot in the way of comorbidities. But again, that's a very, that's a, that's a harder area to sort out. Um, but there are many cardiologists, many GPs, who feel like, based on some data that's not very well not very rigorous data that there may be some benefit to trying to maintain sinus rhythm in relatively younger healthy people. But the, for the vast majority of people we've been talking about, the cohort 65, 70, 75 and above with other comorbidities, if they don't have a lot in the way of symptoms, there's no compelling reason to try to maintain sinus rhythm, at least based on the data that we have available currently. So to summarize, this is the last slide. Device detected AFib or incidentally detected AFib is pretty common. We don't really know a lot in terms of optimal treatment strategies. Right now, if those episodes are going on for more than a few hours at a time, 12, 24 hours, we tend to anticoagulate. Shorter episodes that last a few minutes here or there don't seem to be associated with an increased stroke risk, so we don't anticoagulate them. But where that threshold is between a few minutes and 24 hours is a moving target. Risk factor modifications we talked about is a big part of AFib management. Most people, the vast, vast, vast majority of people for the reasons we talked about with AFib, benefit from anticoagulation independent of bleeding risk. And as we talked about, I think antiplatelet therapy, whether aspirin alone or aspirin and Plavix, should have a very limited role. I put that in there. It really, in my mind, has no role in terms of stroke prophylaxis. Anticoagulation is really where the benefit is without exposing to the bleeding risk. Talk a little bit about the question we're often asked uh, patients that are going to surgery do need to bridge yep. the dressing. Yeah, I thought about adding spot on bridging. Um, to put it very, very, very broadly, most people don't need to be bridged. So for a long time, there was a lot of enthusiasm about bridging people. Um, there have been a number of studies comparing bridging to no bridging, and by and large, bleeding outcomes seem to be worse when you bridge people. For the average person with atrial fibrillation, they don't need to be bridged. Because if you think about it, even in that group that has the CHAT2 VAS scores of 7, 8, 9, their annual stroke risk is on the order of 8, 9, 10%. But if you're off anticoagulation for a week, if you take that 10% and divide it by 52, your actual stroke risk for those few days that you're off anticoagulation is really quite low. And bridging seems to increase the risk of bleeding associated with whatever procedure it is that you haven't done. So the only people that I really anticoagulate these days, at least in terms of bridging for AFib, um, obviously people who have a mechanical heart valve, 
and for microvalve disease. Microvalve replacements, they tend to be high risk. Those people often need to be bridged because they got stem from microvalve. Um, people who have had a prior stroke um, tend to be at higher risk, so often we'll think about bridging them. But unless you've had a prior stroke or some kind of mechanical prosthesis, by and large, they don't bridge most people, regardless of risk factor. Because like I said, for that few days, their risk is trivially low, and the bridging seems to only increase their breathing output. Just a comment, but bridging only in a fixed event would be two days. A lot of times people say, I'm going to hold it for a week. Yeah. So you don't have to. Yeah, it just increases the risk. Um, it's helpful to know the half-lives of most of these agents, but for the vast majority of these novel agents, 48 hours is probably enough. You've got some of the year renal impairment, 72 hours, maybe a week's probably too much. Um, there was a lot of concern initially about the fact that there weren't reversal agents. For most of these uh, drugs now, there are reversal agents. They're not very common to use because, fortunately, we don't have to use them that frequently. Even people who have bleeding events, their half-lives are relatively short. It's not like warfarin or dying on maybe up for a few days. But there are reversal of agents, agents available uh, if you really have an injury or stress. Um, but by and large, 48 hours for most bleeding, for most procedures seems to be enough, particularly the renal function drug testing. Any other questions? Yeah, I know that half units come up with all the time in the line, and they're really worried about it. You know, that's where it really gets to be more of an art than a science, right? And I mean, trying to help people understand the relative risks. But again, it's kind of like the perioperative issue. For most people, their stroke risk is not something that you worry about much on the order of weeks or months. It's really a year old or year two. Now, the problem is that if you're 70, 75 years old and have an average, you know, you're an average health, there's a good chance you may live, live another decade with your atrial fibrillation. And there, even if your stroke risk is 5%, a year, if you live 10 years, you know, it gets to be upwards of 50%. It's a hell of a thing. You know, those got really great examples where people, at least over the course of a few months, their competing risk of death from some other cause is probably so high that the anticoagulation becomes less so. But for average risk people, like I said, I think that they're, by and large, they tend to benefit. Yeah? Are you watching these guys like the clips? To the clips? Um, so the, um, there's not a lot of, there's no head-to-head -head data. Um, we think that they're probably comparably, comparably effective. The Acrocure clip, um, if you, I don't know if you guys, it's a little clip that you can put on the appendage from the outside. It has to be put on surgically. So the vast majority of people that get that are either going to cardiac surgery for some other reason, they're having microvalve surgery, and they've had AFib before, and the surgeon can put on the clip at the time that they're there. Or you can do it as a standalone procedure, but it still requires thoracoscopic surgery in order to put the clip on. So for people who don't have a concomitant cardiac surgical indication, the percutaneous procedure, the watchman, tends to be quicker. And oftentimes the implant's less than an hour, they're gone the next day. Uh, so it's just a simpler procedure. But the clip is a great alternative for people who need cardiac surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, we're getting some more copies for 